Now I want to start with a question. Are you living with purpose? There's the age old question, what is the meaning of life? And it's pondered by philosophers and psychologists, scientists and psychiatrists. And it's probably a question that we have all asked ourselves or will all ask ourselves at some point or another. All of us desire some kind of purpose, some kind of meaning. If we wake up feeling purposeless, it can be frustrating and disheartening. If we're trying to get to grips with what the purpose is of our lives, it can be confusing and discouraging. And there's different schools of thought that have sought to provide different answers to this question. Do we exist simply to care for nature as natural pantheism suggests? Do we exist simply for the sake of pleasure as hedonism suggests? Do we exist simply to acquire as much knowledge as we can as Platonism suggests? Do we exist to defend individual liberty as per liberalism or to love others impartially as per Mohism or to fulfill our duties towards others around us as per Confucianism? Is life's meaning different for each of us as per subjectivism? Or should we simply do as we wish, believing that life actually has no meaning, which is what is proposed by nihilism? Should we just stop trying to find meaning and just live our lives, which is what absurdism suggests? Or could there be another way of thinking about living with meaning and purpose? I um, have the privilege of leading our alpha group. And this week in the video we were watching, Nicky Gumbel, who is a pastor back in the UK, used the analogy of baking a cake. And he said that if he bakes a cake, a scientist might be able to determine what has gone into the cake. They might even be able to determine when the cake was made. A baker might be able to look at that cake and determine how the cake was made. But only Nikki, as the one who made the cake, could actually tell you why he made the cake. The creator is the only one that can determine the purpose. And so the Bible, which is the story of God, the story of the creator of the universe, makes that same claim that only the creator can determine the purpose. And that presents us with what is called theism. And that idea is that our meaning in life is simply to follow God's will and to glorify him, to let the creator determine our purpose. And so we're going to be diving into the book of Nehemiah which tells the story of an ordinary man who God used to do extraordinary things. Because in the story of Nehemiah, we can see how we can find our purpose, how we can pursue our purpose, and how we can live out our purpose. So today I want to look specifically at three steps that we can take in the pursuit of purpose. We're going to start in Nehemiah 1, but first let me give you a little backstory to the book. Back in 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, which was the city of God's people, and he destroyed the city. He killed thousands of Jews, and he took the remaining Jews back to Babylon. And they, they were held captive there, and he sought to... Um, mix them with the Babylonians to infiltrate their culture and to change their culture in order to weaken them as a people group. Well, then in 539 BC, about 30 years later, Babylon itself was conquered by King Cyrus of Persia. And according to the book of Ezra, which sits at the, in the same point of history as the book of Nehemiah, and also sits right next to Nehemiah in our Bibles, in the following year, 538 BC, King Cyrus actually decreed that those Jews who were held captive in Babylon could return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And so there was a, a portion of those Jews, a number of those Jews, thousands in fact, that returned to Jerusalem. They're referred to as the Jewish remnant, and we'll see that in just a moment in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 2. Fast forward a little bit further, eight years later, after they've been allowed to return, around 530 BC, 
The Jews are now facing opposition from their enemies as they were rebuilding the temple. And we read about that in Ezra chapter four, verses four and five. And then in 464 BC, we have a new king on the block. He's King Artaxerxes. And we'll also read about him in just a moment. And in 464 BC, he ordered that that rebuilding work in Jerusalem had to stop. That's in Ezra 4 verse 21. We pick up the story, Nehemiah chapter one, verse one, in 445 BC. So that's about 20 years after the work has stopped. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, that's around November, December in our, our calendar. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, so that's referring to the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, so those that had gone back to Jerusalem, and also about Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is still in Babylon. We're actually going to learn later that he is the cupbearer to the king, to King Artaxerxes. And his brother, Hanani, comes to visit from Judah. So that means that his brother is one of the remnant that has returned to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah asks him, how are things going? How are our people doing? How's the city? And he gets this report in verse three, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned uh, with fire. By any measure, this is not a positive report. The people are in great trouble and disgrace. There's no leadership, there's no direction, there's, uh, they have no confidence and they have no hope. And the city's walls are broken and its gates are burned. There's no protection and the city is left vulnerable. Now, I wonder what your response is when you get bad news. I wonder what your response is uh, to the pain uh, that you feel sometimes. Do you try to deflect it, to ignore it, to shelter it, to shelter from it, I should say, or do you accept it and embrace it? Do you push the pain away or do you let it in? Chapter four, Nehemiah writes, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. You see, Nehemiah embraced the bad news. He let the pain in and he chose to let his heart be moved. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. I want to suggest this is the first step to pursuing our purpose, that we need to let our hearts be moved. Sometimes God works through our pain to lead us to our purpose. Sometimes it's when we walk through the fire that God actually gives us the faith to help others to face the fire. An example, my mum went through three cancers and after she'd come through her first cancer, one of the first things that she wanted to do was to get involved in cancer research. Why? Because her own pain actually revealed a new purpose for her and God took a bad situation and turned it to good. But it's not just our pain that can lead us towards our purpose, often it's our passions too. And it's often said that God works at the intersection of our gifts and our passions. So that place where our gifts and our passions come together is often a good indication of the purpose God has for us. So what is it that moves your heart? Clearly this news about his people and his native city moved Nehemiah's heart. He sat and wept. He let his heart be moved. But then we see that he let his spirit be moved. Having sat and wept, he knelt and prayed. He says, for, for some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. For some days actually turns out to be about four months. And we can see that uh, by the following verses. So chapter one, verse five through chapter two, verse eight, all happens in one day. And we're told in chapter two, verse one, that that day is at the, in the month of Nisan. And the month of Nisan is four months after the month of Kislev, which is where we started in Nehemiah one, verse one, when his brother arrived with the news. So four months of mourning and fasting and praying, Nehemiah let his spirit be moved. He drew close to God. He most likely prayed for his people. 
He prayed for his city. He probably cried out to God, for God to move and do something. And what a place for him to find himself in. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king who had actually ordered the work to stop and left Jerusalem in that state. But over the course of those four months, as Nehemiah spent time with God, as he let his heart be moved and let his spirit be moved in prayer and fasting, God revealed something of his will and purpose and plan to Nehemiah. Nehemiah 2 verse 12 tells us um, in Nehemiah's voice, he's speaking first person, I'd not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. You see, God put something in his heart as he spent that time in fasting and prayer. It was in that place of coming before God, in that time that he gave to coming before God and seeking God through fasting and prayer, that God revealed his will and his purpose for Nehemiah. So what is it that moves your heart? Maybe it's something like thinking about children who can't read or who have special needs or those who are bullied or neglected or abused. Maybe it's thinking about people who are bound by addiction, whether that's to drugs or alcohol or to destructive behaviors and thinking patterns. Maybe it's thinking about the homeless or the trafficked or the impoverished people uh, that don't have access to clean drinking water or don't um, have access to uh, the medication that they need for preventable diseases. Maybe it's those who don't have access to the Bible in their own languages, or those who never heard about Jesus. Maybe it's uh, the cause of the unborn child. Maybe it's something else entirely. Each of these things are, are, are motivators for people to get up and act and do something. What is it that moves your heart? What is it that you are passionate about? And importantly, have you taken it to God in prayer that not only your heart would be moved, but that your spirit would be moved? We need to let both our hearts and our spirits be moved. And it's only then that we can let our bodies be moved. It's then that we need to act on it. And I want to suggest that that is the third step to pursuing our purpose, to step into action. But that only comes after the first two steps. Don't act on something if you're not passionate about it, because you're never going to find purpose in something that you don't have a passion for. And don't act on something that you haven't prayed about, because you're never going to make the difference that God intends you to make if you try to do it on your own. If we think about some of the people in history that have made a real difference, we probably don't feel like we could be anything like that or we could make a difference like that. So you might think of William Wilberforce. Um, working to abolish the slave trade in the early 19th century, or Christine Kane, who is working to abolish the modern slave trade today. Maybe you think of Martin Luther King fighting for uh, civil rights and equality. If you're a scientist, maybe you think of uh, people like Gregor Mendel, who founded the science of genetics, or Isaac Newton and his laws of gravity and motion. Or maybe you would think of someone like Florence Nightingale and her impact on nursing or Mother Teresa and her service to the poor and the destitute. There's all sorts of people throughout history that have lived with great purpose. Their lives have had great meaning and they've made a great difference, had a great impact. It's easy for us to look at them and think, but who am I? What difference could I make? What could I possibly do? And here's the thing. Each of these people, just like Nehemiah, are ordinary people. Ordinary people that God has used to make an extraordinary difference. And if God can use them, he can use you. And the secret is this, we've got to get the God of heaven involved. You may just be one ordinary person, but one ordinary person plus God makes all the difference. Every one of those I just mentioned has made a difference in history and made a difference in our world because they have partnered with God. Every one of them had a faith in God and allowed him to determine their purpose and lead them. It's what we see here with Nehemiah. Verse five, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you. 
day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. This prayer that he goes on to pray, as we'll see in a moment, is the prayer that Nehemiah prays to ask God for favour as he steps into action. He's let his heart be moved. He's let his spirit be moved. He's about to let his body be moved. But before stepping into action, he prays. And his prayer, in essence, is this. God, help me. Nehemiah recognises he can't step into his purpose alone. He needs God on his side. Now, there's a lot that we can explore theologically in his prayer. I don't have time to go through all of it today. Just a couple of things to mention. A lot of the prayer is actually based on uh, Deuteronomy. So Nehemiah is actually using scripture to guide his prayer. And that's something we can take as a model and as a tool to help us when we pray. We can pray using the word of God. Similarly, there's a repeated theme of covenant, which in itself is a repeated theme throughout scripture, particularly in the Old Testament. We see it here as Nehemiah addresses God as the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. And the thing about God's covenant of love is that it is supposed to be reciprocal. And so Nehemiah says, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. God blesses those who keep his commandments, not because it's a transaction, but because his commandments are there to protect us and actually to lead us into blessing. They're not there to limit us and hinder us as the lies of this world would have us believe, but they're there to lead us into blessing. They're there to show us the best way to live. And if you walk in God's ways, the promise is this, you will experience God's blessing. And this is part of God's covenant of love. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. It goes on to say that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. So if you're not prospering, if your leaves feel withered, as it were, if you don't feel fruitful in your life, I just want to encourage you to check that you are walking in the ways of God, that you are staying in covenant with him, that you are loving him and keeping his commandments. That is the way to blessing. Nehemiah knew God's covenant of love, and he knew the Israelites had broken that covenant. And so his prayer is informed by that and addresses that. And so in Nehemiah's prayer, we see two flows. In verses five and six, there's praise and then there's petition. Verse five, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, that's praise. Verse six, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. He's petitioning God. So prayer and petition. And then in verses six through 11, there's repentance, a reminder, and a request. Verse six, I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my family, have committed against you. And he repents of the way that they have acted wickedly towards God, which literally means to offend God. Verse eight, he then goes on to say, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses and talks about the promises that God made to his people through Moses. And then verse 11, give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. There is the request. So a repentance, then a reminder to God of God's promises to his people, and then the request, give your servant success today. The request follows repentance. Nehemiah gets himself and his people right before God, before asking God to move on their behalf. And in the request, there's this indication that Nehemiah is stepping into action. Give your servant success today, he prays. And when he says by granting him favour in the presence of this man, this man is actually revealed in the very next statement. I was cupbearer to the king. So this man is the king, King Artaxerxes. In effect, in his prayer, Nehemiah identifies the king as just another man, a man of equal position to himself before God. Both of them equals under God's sovereignty. And Nehemiah recognizes that God can move the king to act in his favor. In fact, back at the beginning of Ezra, we're told that the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to free the Jewish captives in Babylon and to allow them to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. That's in Isaiah 1 verse 1. 
So we already know that God can move the heart of a king. And so Nehemiah prays that God would do the same thing for King Artaxerxes. Yes, he might have been the king that ordered the rebuilding to stop, but God can move his heart to make the rebuilding restart. Let's never underestimate what God can do. He can turn the heart. He can turn the direction of man. He can turn the heart in the direction of our leaders. Don't underestimate that God can do wonders in the heart of our national leaders. That's exactly what he did here. God can move the heart of a king in the favor of his people. He's done it before. We see it here in King Cyrus. We see it again in King Artaxerxes and he can do it again. And so having prayed and committed his actions to God and asking God to give him success, at the beginning of chapter two in verses one through five, Nehemiah takes the wine to the king as his cupbearer and makes his request. And again, we see how prayer plays such an important part in Nehemiah's life. In verse four, the king said to me, what is it you want? Nehemiah goes on, then I prayed, to the God of heaven, and verse five, and then I answered the king. Nehemiah has mourned and fasted and prayed for four months. God has put a plan in his heart and then he steps into action. But before he does anything, he prays this prayer of repentance, reminding God of his promises and asks for success. But even then, in the middle of his conversation with the king, before answering the king, he prays again. Prayer is so important. And James in the New Testament tells us that the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Prayer moves the heart of God. And sometimes it moves God to move the heart of man. We need to be in constant communion with God. And when we are, if those prayers are partnered with obedience in our lives, then we're sure to be working and walking in obedience and purpose for our lives. And so Nehemiah asks, verse five, if it pleases the king and your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And so Nehemiah steps into his purpose. And we're gonna continue exploring that over the coming weeks. First, Nehemiah sat and wept. He let his heart be moved, then he knelt and prayed, he let his spirit be moved. Then he stood and he took action. He let his body be moved. These are three steps we can take in the pursuit of purpose. So what is it that moves your heart? Have you spent time with God seriously praying about it? And what has God put on your heart to do? This is the model we find at the beginning of Nehemiah. I believe it's a model that we can all learn from if we are looking for purpose in our lives because God does have a plan and a purpose for each of us. The Bible is very clear about that. If you're in that place of longing for meaning and purpose in your life, take the time to think about where your gifts and your passions intersect. What is it that moves your heart? having identified what moves your heart, take the time to seriously pray about it. Not just for you to pour your heart out to God, but to take time to listen for what God has to say to you. For Nehemiah, God put a whole plan and strategy in his heart for how to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Just imagine what he could do for you. Don't underestimate what God can do. And maybe you're sat there today and you know that God has already put something in your heart. If that's the case, what are you going to do about it? For Nehemiah, the very thing that broke his heart was the very thing that God called him to do something about. Not just to pray about, but to act. Not just to pray for change, but to be the change. So what is it that God is asking you to do. And if you're sat watching this and you're thinking to yourself, I don't even know God, so how could he possibly use me? Then I want to give you an invitation to come to know God today. Nehemiah prayed, God, give me success today. 
Perhaps your prayer should be, God, I want to know you today. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each of us. Thank you that as our creator, we are not here by accident, but each of us is here on purpose and for a purpose. God, I praise you that we are each fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. And I ask that you would lead each of us to walk in your ways, to fulfill your purpose for our lives, to further your kingdom, that your kingdom would come, your will be done in us and through us. God, move our hearts, move our spirits, move us into action. Don't let our lives go to waste. You are able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, all by your power working within us. So would you come, Holy Spirit, and work in us, move in us, fill us with your power to accomplish your purposes in this church, in our community, in our nation, and in our world. Lord, we give ourselves to you now. Lead us and guide us as we pursue your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name.